Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Michael Hauder. I cordially invite you to this uh, afternoon symposium, which is entitled Tricuspid Regurgitation, a new prospect in the management of patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Now, if we look at the clinical problem that we are facing here, it's the disease of the tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation. We all have to appreciate that this is a significantly under-recognized disease. When we look a little bit at numbers, in the US, 1.6 million have tricuspid valve-related issues requiring any kind of medical treatment. In my home area, European Union, 800,000 people, elderly patients, are contraindicated for any kind of valve surgery due to their high operative risk and technical contraindications. And in particular, patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, the mean years of survival from onset of symptoms was only 2.28 years, independent of their left ventricular function and their pulmonary artery pressure. So we are dealing here with very sick patients and with patients who don't have a very long life expectancy. Since surgery for those of these patients is mostly not a real option, catheter-based technologies have been developed to address TR. And you can separate them by their mode of action, by aneloplasty devices, by leaflet repair coaptation devices, and then by valvular implant devices, either in the autotopic uh, position or in a heterotopic position. And today we're going to like to focus on this technology, the so-called trick valve technology, which is a bicable catheter-based valve implantation of two valves. Objective of this session is to understand how trick valve can help you in the management of patients with functional tricuspid regurgitation, to know more about this bicable valve system, and to get insights from the Middle East early adoption experience. With having said that, this is the outline of our symposium. Um, we have three presenters here. Dr. Katarina Kiss uh, will give you an insight into the system, the trick valve system, scope and clinical application. Dr. Sandra Samagandi is going to present her clinical and also imaging and hemodynamic experience with the technology. And Dr. Abdullah El Nezi is going to show us a really nice case a stepwise approach, how the device was implanted and how some certain kind of um, challenging moments were uh, solved. And then I'm going to complete that. So with having said that, it's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Katarina to give us an insight into this technology. Thank you very much. Dear audience, Michael, dear co-speakers, thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to give you a short overview over the underlying technology. These are my disclosures. So I think we are all aware that there are different uh, devices out there and I think it's very interesting to understand that um, there are a lot of restrictions to many of the devices when it comes to tricuspid annulus dilatation. Um, we have to consider the tethering of the leaflets. We have to consider the right ventricular function and all of this will lead us to the choice of a device. The trick valve was designed for patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation and carval reflux. So I like to um, refer to the device as a device for right heart failure because I think it's not the valve itself that is having a problem, it's the right heart that is having a problem and that is causing the symptoms such as congestion, peripheral edema, liver congestion, fatigue um, and kidney disease. So uh, it's a set of two um, self-expanding valves with bovine pericardium. It's designed to treat um, the effect of tricuspid regurgitation without touching the native valve. So it's um, a dedicated device and it's the only dedicated device for that purpose. If you look at the device itself, it's, two, it's a set of two valves. I will come back to the special design later. As I already mentioned, it is designed to reduce or to stop the backflow into the carvers thus reducing the deleterious effects of tricuspid regurgitation. It promotes a right ventricular remodeling, it increases the cardiac output, and the target is to uh, decrease symptoms and hopefully mortality. As I already mentioned, it's a dedicated set of two valves. So on the right side, you see 
the superior vena cava valve with a so-called crown. That means that's a design that lets the crown anchor into the confluence of the brachiocephalica. Then you have a belly which will anchor the valve in the straight part of the superior vena cava and the valve bearing segment facing the right atrium. It has a long skirt in order to prevent paravalvular leakage. Um, and as I already mentioned, it's bovine pericardium. On the left side, you see the dedicated design for the inferior vena cava valve, a much shorter skirt because you don't want to block the inflow of the suprahepatic veins, which normally are huge in that kind of disease, and also self-expandable and the landing zone in the lower part. What are our selection criteria? Of course, clinical. We want to treat patients with symptoms. Um, normally, those patients tend to be in Newhouse stage 3 or 4, despite optimal medical treatment. If we look at the hemodynamics, we need a uh, right heart catheter to demonstrate a V-wave into the cavas, which should be more than 15 or minimum of 15 millimeters of mercury. The right ventricle should be viable with a, a capsi of about 12 or above. And in the clinical trials, we restricted the use to patients with an ESPA below 65 because we didn't want to mix up with a population of primary pulmonary hypertension. In the CT, you can see that there are different measuring points. So the CT is the um, method of choice to determine the anatomic suitability. The trick off comes in different sizes. Due to its self-expandable natures, you will be able to cover the vast, vast majority of the anatomies with the underlying sizes. Very important, it's dry tissue technology, so it means the device comes pre-mounted, pre-loaded off the shelf. Um, the dry tissue has been shown to um, increase safety, of course, decrease the handling time of the valves. We see less calcium content, a better tensile stress resistant, and the durability was all done perfectly well. And this is just a short example of how the device comes into your cath lab. So very easy to use, very safe, very simple as the procedure um, in general. So you simply need to flush the device for three minutes, no crimping or mounting in the cath lab, and then it's ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Katerina. We're going to have a dedicated discussion section after the next presentation, so then you have a chance to use the microphones in the room to pose your questions if you like. Now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Sondas to give her presentation on the clinical outcome we had post trick valve by cable implant. Okay, good afternoon. I'm happy to see lots of us still there and hanging on. So my presentation will talk about, you know, preparing the patient and the outcome and the procedure. So we know from not like, you know, it's very well known that ISO-ATR hold a very bad prognostic uh, factor on the patients, even if you are in an asymptomatic. The worse that you are, the worse the survival and the more the cardiac event. And mortality in severe symptomatic TR may reach up to 45% per year. And that has been attributed to the complicity of this group of these patients and um, how significant that early detection of these patients may be playing a, role, a key role factor in treating them. And as you can see, this is one of the most important slides that the lower the symptom burden, the better the response and the recovery of the patients when you intervene. And the worse the certain uh, symptoms burden of the patients, the worse the outcome. And unfortunately, most of our patients are usually referred in the late stage. Uh, with the success of TAVI and CLIP in the last uh, five to 10 years, they've been more focused now on the tricuspid and understanding. We found new nomenclature, new classification, more image approach, and more quantitative methodology going on now. And yet the guidelines are still having hard time to catch with us, and you can see from the European guideline, it's still in the 2BC uh, to consider even trans uh, catheter approach for treating those patients. For the current status, in the morning we had an excellent session talking about edge to edge repair and valve replacement. And today we're going to talk and focus on the bicaval approach. And this is a proposed criteria I've been had, been going out for the last one year, talking about where to go with these patients. And you can see that there are patients who are non suitable for conventional treatment, and maybe a caval approach will be the best for those patients, especially when they are non imaging dependent. Uh, suitable or you have a huge coaptation gap. 
So we went through this already with Dr. Kiss regarding the hemodynamics and the reason for that. You need some pressure going on in that. You have a regurgitation volume going on in the RA and back to the liver and the kidneys, and that's why we're putting uh, superior vena cava and an inferior vena cava. And we demonstrated that the long, kiss we, uh, the long skirt we have in the superior vena cava to prevent the paraviral leak, and a short, as you can see, skirt in the inferior vena cava to prevent the obstruction of superior hepatic vein. So let's start with the case. So I had a couple of weeks ago a patient who is in her late 60s, uh, status most mitral replacement, and in the last, she has a very stormy course with post-surgical wound infection, and then for the last six months, she's been a resident in a hospital with almost monthly admission with the ascites and right-sided failure. So after a careful heart discussion, TEE, she was not redeemed to be suitable for edge-to-edge repair, and we went with the cable approach as a last resort for this patient, and it was the right decision. So your axis, you're gonna go with a six French in the initial axis from the right groin and a couple of axis five and seven French from the left groin. The five and six is basically going for a PA catheter and also a pigtail for control injection. And the whole notion of that, it's like you can see in the A perspective that the RPA is giving you a landmark where to stand. That's why you will have a catheter there going on. And a pigtail, as you can see, to show you the innominate artery and, you know, uh, sorry, innominate vein and where to implant your device. And this is your target about where implanting the device uh, in a dry fluoroscopy picture. And this is when you start to uh, load the valve or implant the valve. Your target, we talked about the crown, we talked about the belly as an anchoring position, and we talked about having the skirt going from here to here, and this is where your leaf is going on. And these are anatomical, having the PA catheter, you're having the nose here, and the pigtail to mark where you were as the innominate vein. So this is our case you can see here as we are positioning here. Your extra stiff or uh, land request wire should be in the internal jugular vein. And you can see it's a very stiff system, unfortunately, 27.5 French. You can do it with a proglide if you want uh, uh, in the closure device. And we have the pigtail that delineate for us the innominate vein. And this is during the implantation. After we implant, you have to take very slow implanting the valve and take care of the nose cone because you don't want to dislodge the valve on the way out. So we finished with the superior vena cava implantation. We went to the inferior vena cava implantation. And this is more anatomical description that this is what you care for of the superior hepatic vein and the junction between the RA and the inferior vena cava. And this is your aim. Your skirt is about here. So your aim is to avoid obstructing the superior hepatic vein. And that's why their skirt is shorter. And this is to have it more in a perspective of fluoroscopy guided. And this is the only step maybe uh, if you're in early beginning, you have a TEE probe to help you positioning. It's okay to have a maybe a five to 10 uh, millimeter protrusion in the RA uh, safely, but you have during deployment to be very slow and have some traction because there is a tendency of the valve to go up a bit. So this is in our case, as you can see, very slow deployment. Our pigtail was put here to like to have a, like a landmark where is your hepatic vein. And then you can see as we're going very slow deployment, you can see the hooks going on very, very slow. Take your time, don't be in a rush, and your TE probe can help you also with this process. It is done under GA in our case, but I mean, maybe possibly in the future as we go advance and more experience, the procedure can be done under conscious sedation and maybe ICE can help you in the future. So this is after the implantation, as you can see strictly, you can see the valve here going from the inferior vena cava and you have seen no part of our leak and then good hemodynamic response. We did an angiogram, as you can see, there is no we ameliorating the regurgitant volume uh, completely from going downward, so therefore protecting the, the liver and the kidneys. You should expect some increase in the RA pressure because the volume should go somewhere, but at the same time, there is drastic drop in the hemodynamics when it comes to the inferior vena cava. And you can see this being delineated also in the echo perspective as we are abolishing the backflow. And therefore, by default, you are protecting the liver and the kidney. And this is like also in a way as a bailout for failed procedure in terms of the clip or uh, band. 
it has been noticed in the series of cases that maybe in a few months, maybe six months or more, there's some positive remodeling in the RV. And in the trichus theory, we can see a good outcome in the patient in terms of the six-minute walks, even in the questionnaire. Uh, numbers were low, but we have a very good success rate and very low uh, events. So we can see 97% success rate, and we have a very good uh, improvement in the patient. My patient, the next day, there was no more lower lymphedema. The only thing that you have to take care of it is that after the implantation of the inferior, patient might have some phrenic, nave, uh, phrenic nerve pain in their shoulder, which is, should be within two to four weeks uh, subsiding. In terms of the anticoagulation, this was taken from the paper that I just mentioned, but in this particular case, we know that most of our patients already have a pre-existing uh, conduction issue and a an lifelong anticoagulation, but the recommendation in this early experience case to keep the patient either in NOAC or warfarin lifelong. Diuretics, uh, we have kind of expressed enough that don't change your diuretics uh, at front. Keep the patient uh, as their own and then follow them very closely. You might consider also SLG2 inhibitor and then antibiotic prophylaxis for infective endocarditis as usual for any valve implantation. Though this uh, technology is still it's in infancy and the beginning, we have not long-term data, but there are some questions regarding the durability and what is the next step or the long-term planning. And what about having a cardiac implanted devices lead in the future or the pre-existing leads? How are they going to behave? And what if we, God forbid, got an infection in those valves? What is the next step? What would the surgeon be doing? And what, how are we going to treat with it? And what if we had a paravalvular leak? Are we going to coil it or are we going to put another valve? And what if the patient didn't require Because we know it's a low pressure system. So anticoagulation is a factor. I mean, if the patient had bleeding risk or something and you had to stop it, we will have a problem or something. That's a question. And what about the heart transplant candidate prior to the procedure or after the procedure? Still, we don't have much data to support where to go with it, but it's all expert opinion at this stage. And the time will tell us where to go with. So let's wrap this up. TR is often asymptomatic or poorly symptomatic. We have limited knowledge of tricuspid valve disease, and that led the heart team to underestimate the prognostic relevance of the TR. The current, all the current guidelines is based on the surgical outcome, and they are referring to the risk-benefit ratio assessment. And procrastinating and withdrawing the intervention just because the patient is too early or too late is one of the issues that we're facing on a daily basis in our practice. And there are three premises we should be considered. The overall survival in patients with severe TR going in transcatheter approach seems to be higher, actually, and patients are doing better with the quality of life. And once the RV started to dilate and you have multi-organ dysfunction, this is where you have a higher mortality operation at intervention and, uh, and complication, and maybe that time they will be too late to do anything about it. And finally, the tricuspid valve is not forgotten, but is forgiven, so don't take it for granted. And this is my final slide. I cannot stress enough about the importance of this slide. Get your patient early as possible. Don't wait for the referral to have an ascites. That's not a good thing. The moment the patient starts to have symptoms, even mild symptoms, get them to the referral center and start discussing what is your option, either percutaneously or surgically. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonos. It's, it's now time for discussion. So if you have questions, please go to the microphone and, and uh, ask it. In the meantime, maybe I can start, uh, Dr. Katerina. You said that the valve is made out of bovine pericardium. Was there a certain reason why that was selected? Well, first of all, we think that bovine pericardium has a better durability, and especially this is a, is a low-pressure system, so we need a thinner pericardium of a little bit different consistency than we would use in a TAVI. And um, then we simply believe that the bovine pericardium will show better results, and also with the dry tissue technology, this was the better selection. Sometimes the, the question pops up, um, do we really need to have two valves both in the superior and inferior vena cava, or could be one enough? Well, I think from the, first from the animal trial and then also from the patient data and um, preclinical testing, we could show that there is like a two-third to one-third um, uh, flow uh, between the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So we had a few patients where only the inferior vena cava was implanted first for different reasons, and we could see that the patients developed a superior vena cava syndrome. So they had increased jugular pressures, they were complaining about headaches, 
Um, and when we went and implanted the SVC valve through the IVC valve, which is easily possible, we could see that the, all of these symptoms were abolished. So I strongly believe that we need the two valves in order to have a compute, uh, complete solution. If, uh, I may say, we saw the, your case, we're gonna see another case. What is the essential, if people are looking for candidates for this technology, what is the essential imaging technology to be used in order to identify whether a patient is suitable for trick valve? Well, of course, first is always echo because we have to be sure that the patient has a severe or torrentious TR. We have to understand whether the right ventricle is still viable. I mean, the right ventricle doesn't need to be perfect, but it should have the potential um, to cope with uh, at least the closure of the backflow, although here it's much more forgiving than if you put, for example, an autotopic valve because you will have the right atrium as a reservoir. For the imaging, besides that, it's only the CT that is needed. We are working on an MRI protocol for patients with severe kidney um, dysfunction, but in general, you need the CT to understand the sizing of the valves. Is there any special aspect on the CT for um, how to do it? when to and how much to contrast to inject, or is it just a standard CT? It's a standard low-dose CT where we want to see the superior and inferior vena cava. That's all that needs to be shown. I have a question regarding um, dialysis patients, since you mentioned now working on a protocol to avoid renal impairment. Uh, what is your take in patients in a pre-existing dialysis through a fistula or a permicat? So what do you think? Uh, should we go with it? Those, those patients are doable, of course. It's always a question, of course, we, we have to be aware that the dialysis probably changes the calcium metabolism and it might um, change the durability of the valve. But I think in general, those patients are severely ill. If we can help them to ease their symptoms, then it's possible. So the dialysis is no contraindication. Is there any kind of strict contraindication from upfront viewing when you search for patients? For me, trick valve will not work. For me personally, I would say the Anticoagulation is something that we should really see that we can put it lifelong because it's a low flow system and I think this is an important factor. Other than that, pacemaker leads are no contraindication. Prior valve surgery is no contraindication because you don't intervene with the native valve. So there, of course, whatever has happened there before, it does not bother you anymore because you put your valves outside the right heart. I think maybe the sizing might be an issue. Yes. Are they working on bigger size or yes. smaller size, something like that? Bigger. <laughs> bigger size. Um, this, this was really, sorry, this was really an interesting um, observation that in the beginning, of course, we did not realize how big okay. the covers can be because you have covers up to 60 millimeters, uh, so the huge vessels. But what about the presence of pacing leads or ICD leads, or does it prevent future implantation of such devices? No, because the, the maximum that can happen is if you already have a trick valve in place. So first, pre-existing leads are not a problem because they are simply sealed between the vessel wall and the stent frame. But even if you want to go in with an ICD CRT lead, you can still go through the SVC valve. You might lose a little bit of the function because you have again a central lead through the valve, but otherwise it's uh, perfectly well doable. Some people sometimes extend this question um, if you have two leads for pacing and one lead for the ICD or a CRT system, so three leads, do the three leads also allow you to have adequate stability to fix the part of the superior valve? Our maximum up to now was five leads, as far as I remember. Okay. So well, that's a clear <laughs> answer. Okay. Dr. Saunders, you nicely showed us your case and how you did it. Um, can you maybe summarize again for us, what are your main landmarks you look at when you go through your procedure? So as we mentioned in the beginning, we go with the three axes. This is like the standard, we're talking about going by the book. And uh, then uh, having a pigtail to delineate for you the innominate vein, where are you exactly, because this is your landmark. And the PA catheter to show you where is your RPA, because your aim with the uh, the superior vena cava implantation to be as high as possible and because you have a long skirt you don't want to obscure something and the control injection will give you where exactly the innominate vein are and you can work around it and in terms of the and this doesn't need any imaging support at this stage you can go with only fluoroscopy and once you go to the inferior vena cava you might need again some injection you can remove at that stage the PA catheter because you don't need it anymore and then you go with the pigtail to show where exactly your hepatic vein are in relation to the conjunction with the inferior with the RA uh, 
uh, RA uh, atrium. And then the TE can help you with this, how much of a protrusion you're having. And I think we, did, we spoke about that briefly and mentioning we can have up to six to eight millimeter because you might have a tendency to jump up a bit, so you have to have a very good grip on the valve when you're deploying the uh, IVC valve. And then uh, we have a short skirt, so the, and this is why in the CT is very important that delineate the distance because I had one screening failed because there was no existing actually uh, um, space to allow us to implant an inferior vena cava. And the whole notion of that, having a pigtail at the end to show ameliorating of the regression uh, volume back to the liver or the kidneys, and demonstrating a good reduction in the IVC dynamics, and that is one of the key factors why you have to have a V-wave of 15 and above in the beginning of the case, and allowing to have a more stroke volume from the RV going back to the pulmonary circulation, and therefore may increase the cardiac output. So you have to have a good RV to some extent. We have demonstrated by TAPSI. In addition to that, to have acceptable RV uh, left ventricular function. Thank you. I mean, last question for that section. Um, the beauty of the system is that it allows you to reposition the device if it's not completely open. Is there any experience how often that is used, a repositioning? As far as I know with the device, like we have even up to 80%, you can resheat and reposition again. Uh, I didn't need anything in my case. It was simple, straightforward, because we were practicing very slow deployment with a good traction. I don't know if Dr. Abdullah had any requirement for resheathing or something in his case. Well, or, from our limited experience, I think the, the big size of the delivery system and the slow release makes the, the, the system very stable. So there is very little movement uh, when you are deploying the valve. So Having I think that this, uh, it's not my pleasure to invite you, Dr. Abdullah, to give your uh, presentation, your case, a very interesting case. Um, on a trick valve implant again with some challenges throughout the course. Uh, hello everyone and uh, thank you for inviting me to present our challenging case. That's my disclosures. So our case is a 70 year old uh, gentleman with past medical history of his uh, ischemic heart disease, status post cabbage and PCI. Okay, now you can see it, good. Uh, history of hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. He has chronic kidney disease, as alluded by my colleagues, which is very common in these patients. Developed atrial flutter, underwent successful ablation, and also has history of Lewy body dementia. His main issue is recurrent hospitalization with recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. This is happening every two weeks. He's been hospitalized with hepatic encephalopathy. And the idea was that this may be related to his severe TR. So that's the interesting or unusual indication for intervention. His journey with tricuspid regurgitation started back in 2013 when he developed infective endocarditis. So he started having TR, which progressed over the years. And last year, he was actually boarded from Kuwait because we don't do triclip procedure yet. He was boarded to undergo triclip at an exper uh, experience center. Uh, and he had three clips implant, implanted, procedure went well, but one week later his TR uh, came back and they found that one of the clips that was implanted had single leaflet detachment. The case was discussed at that expert uh, center and the decision from the HAP team meeting, I assume related to anatomical reasons that no more interventions can be done for this patient. So he came back to Kuwait and that time we got to see him. These are his investigations. He had an echocardiogram that showed a normal LV function. He has severe biatrial enlargement, moderate dilated RV which, um, with mild systolic dysfunction, which is a very important thing to keep in mind. We're thinking about trig valve. His tap says borderline at 12, and PA systolic pressure of 50. He also has an interesting uh, persistent left SVC, uh, which we didn't know if we, if we'd cause an issue with implanting this valve or not, especially the SVC valve. His SVC uh, measurements were 19 and 22, and IVC measurement 32 at the hepatic vein. Blood work shows a very high uh, ammonia level, which is related to his uh, hepatic uh, encephalopathy or end-stage liver disease. He has hepatomegaly and ultrasound with hepatic vein reversal related to the severe TR. And right heart cath showed a V-wave of 50 millimeters mercury in the SVC, RA, and IVC. And this is very important to have that 15 or above, because that will, uh, will ensure that these valves will close. If you don't have high pressure in the RA or SV, uh, SVC, IVC, if you implant these valves, they will not close. They will stay open. So it's important to do right heart cath 
uh, when you're uh, assessing the candidacy of a patient. So we discussed the, the case at our uh, heart team meeting. Uh, we thought this, the only option for this patient is trick valve, given that he underwent unsuccessful trick triclip. Given the severe liver disease, we wanted to avoid general anesthesia, so we, we decided to do the procedure with local anesthesia and transthoracic guidance. And given the RV, mild RV systolic dysfunction, implanting these valves, we had concern that the RV function might worsen immediately after deployment, so we had IV dibutamine as a, as a bailout uh, strategy. So this is our first floral. You can see this is similar to what Dr. Saunders showed on one of her slides. You can see the excessive motion of the lower part of the three clips, uh, which, which is the one that has single leaflet detachment. The patient has sternal wires. As you can see, this is related to his uh, previous open heart surgery. So we started by uh, injecting and doing angiogram of the SVC. As you notice, we don't have a catheter in the pulmonary artery like the Dr. Sundas showed. And the reason behind this, we were concerned that if we go up into through the tricuspid valve, we might dislodge that, uh, that uh, singly detached clip and induce pulmonary embolism type phenomena. And we'll be in deep trouble in that situation. So we elected to use the sternal wires as landmark for our deployment of the SVC. So, and the landmark, if you count with from top to bottom, we decided to implant lower part of the valve at the fifth, inter, uh, fifth sternal wire, and the belly will be around the, the second and the third. Now we're doing angiogram of the hepatic vein to uh, decide on the, on the position of the IVC uh, valve. Here we are deploying our SVC valve. You can see the lower part of the valve at the fifth, inter, uh, fifth sternal wire. So we do, uh, like Dr. Saunders so eloquently uh, illustrated, slow deployment. Uh, and the valve is, as you can see, very stable, stayed exactly where it is. So that to answer Dr. Uh, Howdy's point, the, the valve is very stable. And when you remove the system, it's very big. You can see the nose cone is really big. You have to do it very slowly because you can easily pull this valve down. So you have to do that very controlled, uh, very smooth uh, pull down. Okay. So we finished the first part of the procedure. Now to the uh, IVC valve. So we are doing an angiogram to decide in the position. We leave the pigtail inside the hepatic vein as a, a landmark. In this case, we had a very short distance between the hepatic vein and the RA, which was about 10 millimeters. As uh, uh, Dr. Kiss showed that the, the covered part of the valve is around 20 millimeters. So we had to have part of it protruding in the RA. So the position has to be very carefully uh, chosen. You can see the hand of our uh, echocardiographer doing the transthoracic, uh, helping us implant our valve. Okay. So I move forward, but this is being deployed very slowly. Okay. So at this point, I think angiographically the valve looks in a really good position, but the uh, we had two concerns. The first one, when we measured the pressure in the IVC, the pressure did not drop. So we were concerned, is there a leak or not? And the transthoracic echo showing concern, maybe there is a paravalvular leak. So we thought really hard about what to do at this point. So this might answer one of your questions, can you do uh, how you deal with a paravalvular leak? So right or wrong, we decided to go ahead and implant another valve to make sure that we seal the paravalvular leak. So, so what happens in the next slide? This is the angiogram, but in the angiogram, you don't really see much leak. We were convincing ourselves, but we don't really see much. And then look what happens next. Oops, the valve has moved up. And the, we did that actually by trying to cross with the, uh, the other new valve. We pushed the implanted valve already up, even though we're trying to do it carefully, but it easily jumped up. And that's the tendency of this valve. You cannot pull it down, you can easily pull it up. So that's learning point. So now we are trying to uh, pull the, 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 uh, this IVC uh, valve down. We have a wire across, we sneered it, we're trying to pull really hard, but it, it's, it will not move, okay? And you can see how we, when we let go, it just kind of jumps up. So at this point, we decided to go ahead and implant the new valve, but keeping tension on the, the already implanted valve to prevent it from continuing to go up. So at this point, we are moving the new valve inside. You'll see it's shortly moving up as we are applying tension of the already implanted valve. 
you can see it moving up. Okay. Thankfully, we did not dislodge it uh, anymore. And that's the final deployment. And if you see, it's deployed exactly the same position where we deployed the first one. So in, in retrospect, the result we had, we, had, we had was perfect. It's just we didn't trust the fluoroscopy, and we were concerned because of the pressure didn't drop, uh, and the echo showing maybe there is some paravabular leak that was mild. So the patient did well, actually. The, we closed the uh, venous axis with two proglides, discharge in day two on anticoagulation of abixaban. The interesting thing is ammonia level uh, on day of the admission was 220. The next day following the procedure dropped to 50. And the, this procedure was performed about three months ago until today, well, till, till yesterday, to be honest. The patient did not have any uh, hospitalization with hepatic encephalopathy, which I think from a patient perspective is a huge success. This is the echo at 30 days. You can see the TR still here. This is a kind of a modified apical view. You can see the protruding SVC valve and the RA. The TR is still there, of course, so that's a very important point because the, the, the echocardiographer will tell the patient, you still have the TR. So the patient might think, well, I, I was not fixed. Um, but the RV function actually improved after we implanted the valve. And this is the IVC showing the two valves. Uh, the top is the liver. This is the IVC. This is the properly positioned, and this is the displaced one. So we learned a lot, actually, from this case. Uh, we think that perfect is the enemy of good, even though I would argue the result was perfect, but we just didn't like it uh, because we didn't know any better. The trig valve procedure can be guided by fluoroscopy. You should use the echo as a supportive, but you shouldn't make your main decisions based on echo. Uh, fluoroscopy uh, uh, is the mainstay in terms of imaging. Once the valve is deployed and implanted, you cannot move it but the valve is fully resheathable up, up to 80%. So if you don't like it uh, and it's open to 60 or 70%, don't try to move it at that time. Sheath it, readjust, and start again. So that's the learning point. Uh, you can put a valve in valve to deal with a, a true paravalvular leak, but you be very careful that you, you don't dislodge the, uh, the other valve in, and you need to maintain pressure. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdullah. Um, you showed us the case not done under general uh, anesthesia for certain reasons in this particular patient. In, in general, is that a procedure that should be done under general anesthesia or in the learning phase done under general anesthesia? Or you think you can liberally use conscious sedation or even local anesthesia? Um, to be honest, the cases we've done so far are all under local anesthesia. And I don't think the failure in this case or the, the, the reason they made it complicated was the absence of TEE. I think it's just the, our, uh, we don't have extensive experience with the interpretation of the hemodynamic assessment after the valve. So what was really concerning for us is that the pressure in the IVC did not drop. But the echo did show, the transthoracic echo showed that the hepatic vein reversal has disappeared after we deployed the valve. So I think that was the key learning point, that the pressure may not drop, but if you, if you see the hepatic vein flow reversal improve significantly, that might be, uh, you should be happy with that. And the leak, even if you have a little bit of leak, it might, this is a self-expanding valve. It, over time, it might continue to expand, find its position, and seal itself. So that's is, the learning point. Is this a common observation that you see that improvement in hemodynamics immediately when both of the valves are implanted? I think the, the issue that the, this was the second case on the day, and the first case was perfect, and we had a drop of pressure on the IVC. So in our mind, that's what we're, we're expecting. It's like we are TAVI operators. When you put the new valve, you expect the gradient to go down. So it, it, I think that's what swayed our decision in this case. But in retrospect, we should have been happy with the first implant, which was great. The flow reversal went away. And the, the, the second valve we implanted in the IVC was exactly the same position we implanted the first one. For the sake of the... Oh, oh, just maybe just uh, one more. I think at the moment, 50% of the procedures are done in local um, sedation. So I think this is the future to go. And as we, as we saw, less and less echo guidance is needed once you have more experience. It's really just for the moment when you deploy the IVC valve, you want to see how much you protrude into the right atrium. This might give you a little bit of a guidance. Um, but I think the more experience you get, the easier it will be. 
Yeah, and I think this is really important because, you know, we have to remember that these patients are really, really sick patients. It's the kind of patients now, no, no one wants to manage. They, they, are, they go to the hepatologist and then they see the gastroenterologist, they see the renal patient, the, the nephrologist, they see the heart failure specialist, and they're just, you know, running around doctors and they have very poor prognosis. So generally they don't tolerate general anesthesia very well. So you want to do, uh, you want to be as minimalist uh, with them as okay. possible question regarding the general anesthesia because usually it's driven by the requested of a TEE. So we do you think it. it's like the TEE can make or break your case or you can just consider the transthoracic as I did in Dr. Abdullah's case? I think you can try because if you have a good echo window and most of those patients are rather cachectic, you can have, if you have a good subcostal view, then I think this is good enough because you really need it for, let's say, three to five minutes during the implantation. And so I think it's safe to move, if you have a good echo window, it's safe to move with a transthoracic echo. Uh, windows to I, go through is the subcostal, right? Yes, subcostal. Okay. I, and as I just said, um, last week in Cleveland, one case was done with IVOS guidance only, so zero contrast, so there's always room for improvement for all of us. Uh, th this is a very important point, because in, in, in both of these cases that done that day with, with the uh, TTE, we made sure we had good images before we started the case. Uh, so we, we don't have any surprises during the case. But here it's also not very difficult because you don't want you don't need to visualize the tricuspid valve. You only want to visualize the bicarval view. You want to see if, um, you want to image the hiatus so where the IVC goes into the right atrium. This is what you want to see, and there you want to see how many millimeters of the valve of this metal frame are protruding into the right atrium, and this is the only information that you really need. Dr. Allah, we, we have seen two cases now where the trick valve was used as the last resort of option. Um, we have seen two failures for the tricuspid clipping. Um, what do you see, or where do you see the role of that technology? Is that the role at the very end of the pathway of technologies we can apply to that disease, or should we try to bring that at an earlier stage because of its safety, because of its ease of use? is like not the very early stage because again there, those are tissue valves okay so we know the durability from the, what we have from the surgical data we know okay eight years ten years then what and still what can we implant another one then what so if a patient he's in his 40s DCM in like a old carcinoid for example maybe yeah we can put uh, by cable but after eight years ten years what's gonna happen so I don't know, to be honest with you, like, you know, lifelong management, but maybe, and at the same time, I don't want to push it just for people who are desperate, demented, bedridden. No, we want to give it for someone who can add quality in their life, actually. So we're still not very early, and it's still not very late, because both, by the way, both treatment options, like it, which is commercially available, edge to edge repair versus cable, both of them are very early stages. We cannot say who is durable. And he can just show us that even though CLIP was successful initially, it opened at the end. Thank you very much. In the sake of time, it's now my pleasure to summarize this uh, symposium we had. And if you can bring up my slides, please, I would appreciate that very much. So what we have learned throughout the last 45 minutes, first of all, I think we have to appreciate that trick valve is feasible in advanced heart failure with tricuspid regurgitation, even in the presence of pacemaker or ICD leads in situ. It is independent of any kind of disease of the tricuspid valve, annular size, et cetera, because there is no interaction with the autotopic valve. The trick valve is the only medical device at the moment consisting of two pre-mounted dedicated valves for bicaval implantation in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. We see that the trick valve reduces the backflow into the cava, and therefore the signs of heart failure, such as pericardial edema, cetus, hepatic congestion, with the related secondary symptoms, which in particular we have seen with the second case of Dr. Abdullah. And the trick valve implantation is quite safe and a straightforward procedure, as we have seen, not requiring excessive intraprocedural dedicated imaging skills, which is in this part here mostly angio-guided. So you don't have to be a super expert in echo in order to perform the procedure as you have to be when you do it uh, in an edge-to-edge -edge procedure. 
With having said that, I thank all the contributors of the symposium for their valuable contribution. I'd like to thank Orbis Niche for supporting this symposium, and thank you for all joining us in here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.